I wonder, whilst you're hearing this, if you've got milk in your coffee, you've got it in your tea, you've got it on your porridge, on your cornflakes, what would you do if there was no milk? Do you know, it's such a staple thing now in our diet, isn't it? Milk. So many people have it. And I know there's different kinds of milk. But to me, how can an oat or an almond lactate? It's not possible. So it's not real milk, is it? Let's just put it out there now. But I want to say good morning to our resident vet. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Gareth. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. All the better for having you on the show. And, well, so you mentioned on your email to me. So we have um, a little email chat a few days before we go on. And you said we're talking about dairy cows, which to me suggests that there's a difference between a cow and a dairy cow. Is that right? Well, dairy cows have been developed or bred specifically for milk production, Gareth. And that's been happening over really the last 100 years. They've, uh, they've been getting breeds that uh, will produce milk and they're slight in stature, really, but um, produce lots of milk, while a beef cow will be much stockier because that produces the meat that we like to eat, which is the muscle. But presumably... Both of those cows, if they needed to double up, they could provide both. They could, but the, the amount of milk you get from a beef cow would be pretty poor compared to what you get from a dairy cow. Um, a dairy cow, if it's just not even trying, will produce 20 litres of milk a day. Now, you imagine 20 litres, that's uh, about 35 pints bottles of milk and that's not even trying they will get up to you know the sort of 40 liters if they're the peak ones and even higher so they are amazing animals at producing milk uh, but they need lots of tender loving care um the old beef animal tends to be a bit, a bit tougher it's uh it, it doesn't mind going out and getting wet in the all the different conditions and uh, will produce beautiful calves that they'll grow up to be your roast dinner if you have beef on a Sunday. Which sounds, <laughs> when you put it like that, it does sound mean. But this is the thing. So I had that conversation with my daughter because she didn't really associate the fact that we eat burgers with the animal. So I had to do almost that sort of conversation of, the, well, well, actually, it it comes from an animal. And then she was asking, well, what part of an animal? And I was going, well, sort of all of it in a way. What I should have done is said, look, why don't we get Chris, who's a proper vet on FaceTime, and you can ask him all these questions. So how would you go you mentioned that a dairy cow has been sort of changed and adapted over about 100 or so years. What, what type of techniques have they used to do that? So how has a normal cow developed gradually into a dairy cow? Well, what they've done is it's selective breeding, really, Gareth. They, they haven't done anything particularly funny. They've just selected those cows that are good at making milk. And over a period of time, they select the best cows the, f from the herd of best producing milk and then they go for the bulls that are from the cows best producing milk and they use AI artificial insemination so they can breed with a lot of cows with a very good bull and so you get these cows that are strong in stature have a what they call a vessel a big udder that are able to produce lots of milk but also uh, the other thing with dairy cows they we need to do is make sure they can last the distance because they are under stress producing all this milk. They need to be well-bred so they're strong enough to carry all this milk and also they need to be able to look, be well looked after. So one of the th interesting things is how they're bedded down. And um, when I was a dairy vet, we, we got involved with cows actually being bedded down on sand and the farmer would go and get sand. He had a, uh, a sand pit on his farm and bring it in and put it on what they call cubicles, which are individual little pens the cow sits on. And actually the cows loved sand because they, they not because they thought they were at the seaside, but actually the, it gave them a, a very comfortable bed to lie on. And also the sand on the concrete made it was more grippy. So they felt a little bit more, Com comfortable when they were walking around 
It's really interesting, this. So some people may say that, well, is it not cruel where you're basically making this animal where it would not naturally produce that much milk, presumably? So we have had to sort of, I guess, interfere and we've had to change things. So we've changed an animal so that it can fill a human void in a way because we need all this milk. How do we answer that, Chris? Well, I think, you know, it's it's looking at a decent, uh, see where, how well they looked after, Gareth. You know, the, the farmers are not trying these days. There was a time about 20 years ago when they were going just for huge volumes of milk. And they found that the, the cows didn't last the distance, if you're with me. And so they've changed their policy now. They're looking for cows that will live six, seven lactations. So they'd probably be about nine years old um, when they come to their, their end. And they are looked after these days by really skilled farmers and stockmen. You know, you don't get milk out of a dairy cow unless you really know what you're doing. And I guess it was your job when you were a dairy vet to not only take care of the animals when they're not well, but also to make sure that they are being kept well. Exactly. One of the major things that you get the milk to go on your cornflakes in the morning or the, the lovely frothy milk in your coffee, to Gareth, is how well they're fed. And that became quite a passion of mine, making sure that the farmer because they grow a lot of the food on the farm. So they'll grow maize, um, which is like our sweet corn you see growing on the English fields these days, and grass. And they'll also grow things like lucerne, which is a high in protein. But the grass and maize are the two fundamentals. And they cut it, over, obviously, towards the end of the summer. Grass in the, well, and May, and then again, probably in August, September time and maize tends to be have just been cut that would have been in uh, late August September and the way they look after it is extremely important because these crops can go off they've got to last the whole winter and so they've got to be well compacted they're made into silage and well looked after it's a really skilled job to prepare the food so the, uh, the cows are really fed well. So thankfully, it's not something that somebody can just have a go at. You have to have years of experience. And presumably as well, these farms, they tend to have a history behind them as well. So presumably generational. And they will have been passed on from uh, grandparents to children and et cetera, et cetera. So it's not something that somebody could just go, Do you know what, I think I'll open a dairy farm. Now, if you have got any questions for Chris, what we're going to do is uh, we are going to play a song and then come back with Chris in just a moment. But if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Chris, then the number, the WhatsApp number is 0161 511 5 that's 0161 511 Thank you for your questions, by the way. Really interesting to know all about dairy cows and dairy farming. Now, <laughs> this is an interesting one. Sandra says, is it pretty much the same principle when you get milk from other animals? Because we buy quite a lot of goat's milk. So, Chris, is, is it the same? Presumably, there's not as much need for goat's milk as there is cow's milk. No, but actually the, the dairy goat is very similar to the dairy cow. It's a ruminant, so it has four stomachs. And the way you feed a uh, ruminant is you feed the, the rumen and that actually is a, a whole ecosystem of bacteria and yeast and protozoa that break down the um, cellulose in uh, fibres and then release these different chemicals that the cow can then use to make this delicious commodity of milk. Now, a question here. And this is something that um, Lynn's been in touch with. And she says, re cows, they're stressed because their calf is taken from them at birth so they can continue to produce milk by constantly lactating. What do you reckon to that one, Chris? Well, 
I I find with the modern dairy cow, I think beef cows would get stressed, but the modern dairy cow, the way it's been bred, it, it's far more accepting of the calf being taken away. To us as humans, it seems very traumatic, but actually it, it's always a tricky one, Gareth, because we, we change the environment for so many of the animals we live with. And, um, and, and so it's, it's trying to make sure it's done in a kind way. So they normally keep the calf with the cow for at least 24 hours to get the colostrum. And then they're taken away. And generally the cow is so well looked after with food and it's all its other needs are met that it doesn't really pine. If it pined, it wouldn't produce the milk because I've seen stressed dairy cows and they are no good to a dairy farmer. They will not produce milk. We had one where a farmer put a robot in to milk the cows and it wasn't a well-designed robot. And the cows just looked miserable as did the farm, the cowman. And you know, you could see, you wouldn't have thought it, but these cows just look so sad which where my I get my milk from, which David Norton just down the road from us. And his cows always look very happy chewing the cud, lying in their deep bed of straw. They, they are very happy. And this is a thing you would know. <laughs> so you're actually going to these places. And with your experience of 125 years as a vet, um, obviously you would know um, a happy cow from an unhappy cow. Um, so another question in here as well, which is interesting. Does the colour of the cow differ? And I think this question means because you do see sort of complete black cows, don't you? You see some which have got white spots on them. You can sometimes see cows which are more white than they are black. Does that have any difference in the milk it would produce? Uh, not in the milk produced, really, Gareth, but you tend to get dairy, dairy cows. There, there's a few breeds. There's the whole Stein Friesian, which tends to be black and white. But there are a few breeds, which is what we call a recessive gene, which are red and white. So they're the whole Stein Friesians. You also have Jersey cows and the Jersey cows have the big eyes and look very pretty and they're small in stature. And they produce higher levels of butter fat. So you get the best cream from those. And then we've had also the Ayrshire cow, which comes down from the southwest of Scotland. And they are very good milk producers as well. They're red and white. And finally, we're getting breeds coming over from Europe. We have the um, Swedish red, which is a little bit like the Ayrshire red and white dairy cow. And the, um, the Swiss, Swiss cow, this, uh, you know, is, is a sort of quite a heavy cow up in the mountains. That's where you tend to find it. And that is adapting quite well. This my friend David Norton. He has several of those. I wonder if it's easier for a Brit to holiday in Europe now uh, with all this Brexit stuff or a European cow to move over to the UK and give us milk. Interesting <laughs> question there. Um, another one as well. Uh, this one comes in from Tony and he said, to be honest with you, I never knew there was a difference between a dairy and a beef cow. So can you ask Chris, the next time I drive past a field, what characteristics do I need to look out for, which would tell me, I love this question, if it's a dairy cow or a beef beef cow so the thing to look out for is the size of the udder or what the farmers would call the vessel dairy cows will have larger udders because they're producing more milk they also look more bony so a beef cow is tends to be much stockier you know like you sort of a front row forward in a rugby team while the dairy cow, where actually I don't think there's any skinny rugby players now, but you know, a dairy cow would be more what we call angular. So you would see the bones showing a little bit. You don't want it to be really bony, but you want to be able to see probably the first two or the last two or three ribs, that sort of thing. So how many people now, after listening to this, will take more notice to the cows in the field? And I, th I think it's a dairy one that year. Um, another one about cows. And then if you've got enough time, I'd like just to put this question to you, because this came in on Saturday, in fact, this and it was titled um, a question for the resident vet, uh, vet Chris. So we'll do that in a minute. But this one here. 
Um, this one comes in from Amy and she says, would it be safe to basically get a cup and milk a cow in the field and drink it? And I think she's probably referring to, would there be bacteria bacteria in there that would harm a human being? Nowadays, with the way they test cows, the risks would be very, very low, Gareth. Um, I love raw, it's called raw milk and I love raw milk. It's uh, got a different taste to the the milk you get that's pasteurized. Um, we've done a lot of testing on the dairy herds. The milk sent off to check for nasties like brucellosis, that's been eradicated, tuberculosis, that's been eradicated except for certain parts in the southwest, but it's continually monitored. And also for salmonella, which can give you a nasty diarrhea. But you know, basically, if he's getting it, for, if you went out into a a herd that was being milked and tested by the dairy, you would be very, very safe. And also, you know, the human stomach is an amazing thing. It's designed to kill off bacteria and does a pretty good job. I don't know how I'd feel about that. <laughs> I don't know how I'd feel about basically going in a field with the farmer's permission, obviously, and just sort of putting it in a cup and drinking it when it being warm. For... Anyway, let's move on here. Uh, so really interesting stuff, this. And we're so blessed to have Chris on with his years of experience and he can actually tell us all about this. I mean, who knew even, you know, 5% of what he's told us about dairy cows. I never knew. And this one here. So we'll move on to this quickly because it did arrive on Saturday. And it says, could you put this to Chris, please? You've spoken so far about dogs, cats, horses, but many people have limited time and space in their lives. So could you ask Chris, please, what are the pros and cons of smaller animals such as rabbits, hamsters, rats and guinea pigs? Well, the, the, the pros is they don't take up so much room, obviously, Gareth, and they probably don't need quite so much looking after. Um, the disadvantage of these breeds is they don't live for very long. You know, average guinea pig, you're lucky if it makes four or five years. Um, rats, similarly, unfortunately, quite a few suffer from tumours, and that's one of the reasons they can can die early i mean they both i think make excellent little pets um gerbils hamsters again they they'll live for even less time um i think they're the difference to a dog or a cat they're not quite the same of wanting to sit on your lap they tend to be a little bit more scatty and um rabbits i think are a reasonable compromise but you have to be careful. If you have a house rabbit running around your house, you have to make sure it doesn't chew the wires, which can be a problem, and uh, or chew other bits of the house because they are. But they, I know a lot of people really do enjoy having these animals running around, and it gives them a sense of having something to care for and to enjoy uh, seeing how they interact with each other. I'm glad you said that because the follow-up question says about house rabbits and guinea pigs. And can you trust a small guinea pig at home whilst you're out of the house? I guess it is just, would you say that it's it's similar to baby proof in a house? Yeah, I mean, you would, if you had guinea pigs running around your house, I would have it in a confined area. Otherwise, you're going to have wheeze and poos everywhere. They're, they're, they need to eat all the time. They're what we call trickle feeders. And you will be amazed how much fecal matter a guinea pig can produce. We've got three lads in a, in a, in a shed and uh, it's phenomenal what they do. But, um, you know, I would have them in, in confined unless when you're home, then you can have them running around or have one room for them if you wanted to. that You can easily clean out. And is it wise to have them in groups so they don't get lonely? For guinea pigs and rabbits, I would say so, yes. You know, they tend to like company. Um, well, thank you very much. Some really interesting questions coming through there. And Chris, um, thank you very much. Now, we were talking about actually October time because I'm going to have to take some time off because baby number three is arriving. So what we're going to do is uh, Chris is going to take a break over October 
And to be honest with you, I don't know where I'll be. I don't know what I'll be doing. So a few of the guests at the moment, I'm just saying, look, I'll send you a message when I know more to let you know if you're on the radio or not. So you could be with us next week. You may not be with us. But if you're not with us next week, then you won't be with us until November time because you've got plans as well. Uh, Funnily enough, uh, Chris is actually building a brand new veterinary surgery, if you haven't heard about this. And it's due to be opened in January, isn't it? That's right. Yep. January the 30th, we're, we're planning on. Um, and you have the exciting task this afternoon of picking what type of glass you want. Yeah, it's amazing what you learn you have to do. This is, uh, we, we're going with, it's got a, a big glazed area, which we're having to uh, renovate. And we're going with the builders to work out which glass we should use. Exciting. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Take care, and we will catch up with you maybe next week. But if not, you'll be back on the radio soon. And if you've got any questions at all for Chris about smaller animals, bigger animals, uh, maybe there's birds. We haven't touched upon birds at all yet. Then the email is studio at connectradio.com.